Doctors are meant to be stoic, self-contained, empathic, but confident and silently empathic when emotionality is spilling all around you. And that happens a lot with human suffering when you're seeing it day in and day out. Doctors cannot be expressive. We don't have that luxury. Have you ever seen a doctor laughing or crying wholeheartedly when there is human suffering in a clinical setting? I don't think so. It doesn't inspire much confidence, really, does it? <laughs> so emotionality and flamboyance are so not traits for a doctor to have. So when you're a doctor by day and an artist by night, and you're constantly flitting between these two worlds in between, how does my brain work? Let's take a minute to think about the neurobiology of the brain. So the ability to shift set or flip between the worlds happens right here in the front of the brain. It's the CPU, it's the executive director, he's the social moderator, she's the social filter. That is what is responsible for social appropriateness, for logic and for rational thinking. It's a logical or rational brain. Now, the backbenchers, let's take the analogy of the backbenchers. Backbenchers are obviously called as students. You know, that's where all the action happens, the disinhibition happens, and that's where all the emotions and feelings come out. Now, that is like our emotional brain. It's hidden here, but it's somewhere in the back, the limbic system. So that's responsible for emotional expression, management, and regulation. So can we have a show of hands? How many of you here think you have rational brain? Okay. Emotional brain? Oh, overwhelming majority. Okay. Rational and emotional? Excellent. Okay. Left-handed people? Right-handed? Box few. Ambidextrous? Okay. I'm ambidextrous too. Right. So, you see how it is in the audience. Right, left, left, right, right, left. A mix of both, mix of both. Emotional, rational, rational, emotional, emotional, rational, mix of both. So, you as an audience are actually mirroring the fluidity of the brain. So you see my point, it is not about this and that, it's about interconnectedness. That is what the creative brain does, it's about interconnectedness. But, it is not random interconnectedness, it is actually focused interconnectedness that we need. Focused interconnected, uh, interconnectedness to help our brain optimize its potential. So, how does this happen? It happens with positive, gentle, empowering approaches done consistently and with commitment, as happens with music and art. And of course, our chances of success are massively magnified if there is a scientific basis to that. So, if we look at functional imaging studies, the neuroscience and creativity, we're talking about functional imaging studies as in we're not just looking at the structure of the brain, we are actually looking at how it's working when exposed to a response or a trigger. And interestingly, studies have shown that when one is looking at um, an artwork, perhaps enjoying a piece of music, writing a poetry, admiring poetry, writing out and working out a mathematical proof, or even discovering a scientific principle, the same areas of the brain light up. The same areas light up because it's perceived as pleasurable and rewarding, right? So you see how it is. It's not just about creative arts or neuroscience. It's about something much bigger. It is about challenging our brains to think that these are two complete, different, completely different worlds. Because why do the worlds have to be mutually exclusive? I mean, thinking out of a box, an expression we often hear, happens only if you have a box that you're looking out of. So there is a keyhole or a tunnel vision. Frames of windows and borders of boxes, all these put limits on our vision and our ability to look forward. If we allow our brains to, we can actually realize that we, we, we have a lot more potential, we are capable of seeing and doing a lot more. Consider the analogy of the common house fly, which never gets caught. Why do you think so? It's got sensors all around, even at the back of its head. And that is nature challenging norms. Nature is challenging our norms about assumptions, about vision being what is in front of us and what we see. So when you're looking at it from the point of view of the brain, the level of the brain, it's about transmitting or receiving of information. But think about that intangible component of the brain, 
the creative mind, and science and art become something else. It's about observation, imagination, innovation, creativity, dedication. It's all brought together by the correct interpretation and a commitment, curiosity. That's what brings it all together. So what set it off? Um, as a child, through my school and college years, I got lots of awards for art and music, always wanted to be an artist and a musician. And as life would have it, as often happens, I went into medicine. So I was completely disheartened until one day I woke up and I realized that actually medicine itself is a creative art. There is creativity within medicine. And I took that principle through the whole of my training. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I remember the incidents of this uh, child who came to us. He was not talking at all at school, but he was fine at home. We used art as a way of communication, as a, as a way of expression, and we helped him optimize his educational potential. I work a lot with autistic children. I'm a children and young people psychiatrist, and I have seen personally the positive, the tremendous impact of music on brain growth and development. But Obviously, I started to think about how I can actually apply it logically into my practice, my logical brain kicks in. How can we make it acceptable to the scientific community and how can we do something that makes it work for focused populations? There was an offhand comment by a friend I met after many years who said, oh, these are two very different worlds. And I thought, no, they're not two very different worlds, they're just different perspectives. As Wilson said, science explains feeling and art transmits it. And I say it all comes together beautifully in the creative mind. The first step was researching what we already knew about music, emotions in the brain, and how we could bring it all together. Of course, there were lots of challenges and limitations. Uh, many of them were qualitative studies that don't lend themselves to research population, and there was a lack of standardization of approaches that we had to bear in mind. So we looked at the role of music and other therapeutic techniques in self-guided emotional regulation. And we concluded that, you know what, brain activation areas and patterns were closely linked for emotional processing, music, and non-musical stimuli. And a combination of these approaches is likely to support anxiety, depression, adjustment difficulties, and a whole load of other chronic stress-related conditions that we come across in our daily lives. It got me thinking about a new novel model of a multidimensional approach to emotion processing and management. We know emotions have multiple dimensions, and we know that the environment around us is constantly dynamic and changing, so emotional regulation must as well be a complex multidimensional phenomenon. So when we're using unidimensional um, uh, strategies like uh, medicine, like as in medication, art or music or therapy, then it's less likely to support the brain optimally and in some cases may actually be maladaptive. So we found that there was a reliable evidence base for a multidimensional self-guided strategy which involved all of these things. And CAVE was born. Cape, creative arts for processing emotions, a technique that I conceptualized and we were very fortunate to launch it last year at the High Commission of India in the UK. And we went back this year um, to launch the children and young people's version. It was very well received, I'm happy to say. I'd just like to talk a bit about the practical aspect, what went into the thinking behind Cape. So it's simple, it's convenient, it's discreet. That was the way it was intended to be and all you need is to wear a pair of headphones and off you go. Technology supported, there's already a CD out and we are actually bringing out an app by the end of the year which is a part, part of a healthcare, uh, an integrated healthcare portal. It is self-guided, it is also supported. At the same time, it's multi-dimensional, it's time, labor and cost effective, it's, been in, uh, it's intended to work that way and it is intended to support one's existing lifestyle, it's complementary. When we look at the scientific and medical aspects of CAVE, the structure of the technique is backed by peer-reviewed research. It's easy to adapt and scientifically validate, and it amalgamates Eastern and Western music beautifully for wide reach. 
no harmful side effects, and it can be used in conjunction with medication and formalized therapy. Chronic stress is supported by CAPE's consistent training techniques. On an individual level, what's really important, especially in our developing brains, developing years, is that there is a focus on individual resilience, self-worth, and motivation. So CAPE attempts to cover that. And it's not threatening. There is no stigma or taboo associated with it. The focus is on sustainability, not just recovery. And it is used at every step of the process for early intervention, diagnostic clarification, communication, self-awareness, identity, identity formation, the whole lot. It supports recovery from both physical and mental illness, and it can bypass societal and media perceptions about what mental illness is which is a truly important thing. The idea was that it has the potential for wide and easy dissemination. I'm thinking hospitals, community centers, school refuge centers, and women's centers. And if you may ask, why CAVE? And though music is not the only component in it, I say CAVE because music is a gentle, empowering, positive way into one's brain, into the creative mind. So in uh, 2015, I set up I Manus London, which aims to actually bring together five very different worlds, music, arts, neuroscience, and ability in society. And this is through events and projects on global platforms. And the aim is really to support international community development and also to support developing brains, i.e. the youth of our nation. So for me, the conclusion is very, very simple. My science and my medicine have actually made me a better artist and a musician. And my art and my music have made me a better doctor and a psychiatrist. And the twain have joined forces to the point of no return. We are moving forward stronger than ever. Thank you very much.